But God calls his people to be a great light. You know, if you're in the dark place this morning, I want to encourage you because God is, can give you light. God can give you hope. A light can dawn in your life through Christ. You don't have to live in the darkness. Jesus is the great light and he calls us to that great light. The question is, are, will you answer the call? You know, I grew up in this city. This is my home base for, for generations. My grandparents came up here uh, and had a homestead in Anchor Point shortly after World War II. Alaska is in my blood. And I grew up going to church. Uh, I grew up in many churches. I went to a, a few Christian schools in the area. But as I grew up even religious, I kind of became that kind of Christian nice guy. Because ultimately, that was the reality of the Christian world that I'd grown up in. You know, Christians are just kind of nice guys. And that worked for me, you know, for a little bit, you know, uh, until I didn't want to be a nice guy anymore. But always inside of me was this desire to be something for God, to do something for God, to be a real man of God. But all I had around me were either like nice guy Christians or hypocrites. You know, I talk about the Ned Flanders Christianity. That's, you know, for those of you that might remember The Simpsons, it's just the nice, highly, holy good neighbor, just the good, nice dude that lives next to you. That's, he's a Christian. He goes to church. He's just a nice guy. But you don't want his life at all if you're a man. He has no backbone. And when you read the scriptures, when you read about Jesus, you're like, that's Jesus? Not that he's really Jesus, but that's the example of Jesus in our lives. I'm like, bag that, man. I'm not interested. But then on the other side, I would see men like my own father who would go to church with me and we'd stand up, sit down, do all the stuff that we've done here today. And he'd kind of mumble a few tunes and stuff like that. And then he'd go out and be cussing and smoking with the dads out on the, in the, you know, outside the church after church. And even at a young age, I'm going, that, that, just, doesn't, that just doesn't seem right. And I've said this before, and I'll say it many, many times. If you were Satan, what would you want to do? Create a whole bunch of wacky, weird, lame religions that you're just like, that's weird. Sorry, I'm bagging that. No. Or muddy the truth. Or just shift the truth just enough to help guys like me and maybe many of you in this room just be confused and disillusioned with true biblical Christianity. My sister calls me one time, and life was good. I had a really good looking girlfriend, not as good looking as my wife, of course. I had a nice truck. I had a job working for Pepsi. I was making money hand over fist. As a single guy, life was good on the outside. But on the inside, that nice guy routine just got real old. And I started to get darker and darker in my thoughts, darker and darker in my responses, darker and darker in my attitudes. And God knows the right time and the place. My sister calls me up and says, hey, uh, your brother and I, uh, brother-in-law and I are starting a business. We want you to come down here to California, to Long Beach, uh, just for six months. Come help us start this thing, and, uh, and, and it's going to be awesome. I'm like, okay, cool. So I dumped my girlfriend, sold my truck, and left. I don't know. I, don't ask. I don't know why. It was stupid. It was really dumb at the time. I, I, I don't know why I did. I just, I just like, something's got to change. I don't, I don't, I, I'm speculating. I don't even remember why I did it. I just did it. But I'm like, hey, you know, the Beach Boys have a song called uh, California Girls. Maybe this is uh, the way to go. I, I love to surf and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, all right, this, maybe this is a good jam, you know. And I went there, and uh, my, I had to be a good example to my nephew. They went to church. And I'm like, I got to be a good example to my nephew. He was like three years old at the time, so I don't even know the logic of that. But, uh, and so I started going to church with my brother-in-law and my sister. And what I saw there blew my mind. I hated it. I hated it on one hand, but on the other hand, I loved it. I hated it because the dude that was preaching, he seemed angry all the time. <laughs> Furrowed brow, mainly because it's the light in my face. But you know, like, like he just, and he just preached his guts out straight to my soul. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. He had my number. Every sermon, it's like, Armando, are you telling him about me? No, it was the word of God. And what blew me away more than any of that was just seeing my brother-in-law's relationships with other men. And, and I saw in him and in them a, a brotherhood, a, 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 a sharpening of one another, that I was like, I don't see this anywhere but the Bible. 
And I looked at my brother-in-law and I said, Armando, I, I want what you've got. How do I get it? And we sat down and we studied the Bible. What I saw was the opportunity to be the man that I always knew in my heart that I wanted to be. God gave me hope that I'd actually live a life of purpose and meaning. And God gave me hope that I didn't have to harden my heart to the world. And that I didn't have to live pop culture Christianity. Go to Matthew chapter 4. I watched God transform my shallow, purposeless life into one who had purpose. And in Matthew chapter 4 is where I found that purpose. Matthew chapter 4, look here in verse 12. This is the calling of the first disciples. Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee. Imagine maybe walking down Ship Creek, right? Or, or uh, you know, uh, down over there by the Russian River or something like that, if you're familiar. And you've got combat fishermen just, right? This is a fishing town. This is a fishing area. And that's kind of what we see here. But Jesus is walking in the very place where the prophecy in Isaiah 9 that said that the light would dawn. And this is what it says. Matthew 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Natali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Natali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. To those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets. And followed him. This was the call that changed my life forever. I finally saw my purpose was to be a sold out disciple of Jesus, an actual fisher of men, a follower of Jesus who would be an example to the nations, an example to the people around me, not of the weak, milk toast Christianity, whatever you want to call it that it's these days, but a true man of God. Now, I'm not perfect. Just so you know, talk to my wife. She will tell you plenty of stuff that makes me not perfect. But you're not perfect either, amen? If you're looking for a perfect church, you ain't going to find one. Because here's the reality. As soon as you find one, you walk through the door, it's no perfect anymore. Why? Because you're there. That's it. So it's not about, it's not about perfection. It's about direction. Are we headed in the way of Jesus? Or are we headed in the way of religiosity? Okay. Or are we headed in the way of pop culture Christianity? The word here for follow means to enlist in the Greek. Wow. It does not mean just, hey, just walk behind me. Wow. It means to enlist. My brother-in-law was an army recruiter. And so if he came to you and said, I want you to enlist in the United States Army, you would know, at least on some level, what that looks like. <laughs> what that's supposed to be. It's a life change. You are no longer your own person. You are property of the United States government. And if you get a sunburn, you can get in trouble. Serious. Because you're hurting United States property. Does this make sense? Now, I'm sure it's laxed over the course of the last few years, I'm sure. You know what I mean? But the reality is that this is what Jesus is calling you and I to. John 8, 31, 32 says, So the Jews who had believed him, Jesus says, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Somehow, in this wacky, weird religious world, we, we become to understand a false reality, a false teaching, and that there's layers to Christianity, that you could be a believer and still be going to heaven. But then that there's this disciple idea, that it's somehow this like, like oh, they're hardcore. There's like apostle, and then there's like, like disciple, and then there's believer, and then maybe Christian is like right up above that or something. Je Jesus says to those who believe him. This is John 8. He'd seen him turn water into wine. They listened to him preach, and he says, no, no, no. You actually have to do what I'm calling you to do. And what was the first thing he told them to do? Repent. Repent. I remember getting baptized when I was 13 years old, and my dad was there at the baptistry. I was wearing this weird blue robe thing, and, uh, and my dad goes, 
Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Yes. Do you repent? Yes. Then I'm going to baptize you. Boom, boom, done. What did I repent of? I believed that Jesus died. I believed that he rose again. I believed way more than what my, just dad, my, my dad asked me to. But I never changed my life. And between 13 and 20, when I finally became a true disciple of Jesus, I got into more sin in those years than I ever did prior to. It was a darker world for me after that. Why? Because I didn't do it Jesus' way. Jesus says, repent and then come follow me. Repent and I'm going to send you out. I'm going to give you a new purpose in your life. And on September 11, 1999, after studying the Bible, after getting into what it really means to be a true follower of Jesus, a true Christian, I embraced my purpose, repented of my sins, and then I became a fisher of men as I came out of those waters of baptism with the Holy Spirit free from my sin. And I've never looked back since. Before that, I can tell you a million different ways that I questioned my salvation. It's like Jesus, I would in, invite him into my heart, and then he's like, okay, you good? All right, I'm out. Like you left the back, I bring him in the front door of my heart, and then he was out the back door later on. Like I just couldn't change. I just couldn't break through. I just, I, I couldn't have a powerful life that I saw in the scriptures. So it's like, do I, do, is there something wrong with the Bible? Or is there something wrong with the churchianity that I was sold? The Bible's true. And if we get back to it, we can have a powerful life. Einstein had this definition of light. He says, light is movement. Light is a form of energy that is always moving. When light and energy ceases to move, it is no longer light. It becomes darkness. Light is only light because of movement. And when it stops, it becomes darkness. We have to be men and women that keep the light alive. How do we do that? We do that by actually operating according to the principles in the Bible. Yeah. We have to be those that keep the movement of God alive in this generation. If we cease to keep moving, we become darkness. We can no longer bring the light. And isn't this what you and I see in our religious world today? Churches masquerading as social clubs, putting on events to put warm bodies in seats just to give more money so that they can build bigger buildings that are only open two days a week. Campus ministries offering events for students so that they can come and, and sing songs together and eat donuts together, but not doing the Bible studies to get into their lives and actually helping them change their lives. It's the religious world is offering what Paul calls a form of godliness, but denying its power in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It offers this world nothing but confusion and disillusion with God then why would we be surprised that we live in a dark world today? It offers nothing but confusion. Why? Why are they so powerless? Because the word of God does not move them. It doesn't move them for two reasons. One is they read it and they don't apply it because they're not expected to apply it. Or number two, they don't read it. How many, don't out yourself, but how many of you have read more Bible, those of you that are studying the Bible, read more Bible from studying the Bible than you have your previous life. I can guarantee you, I loved God. I wanted, I went to church. I wanted to be with God. But it wasn't until I sat down and studied about my brother-in-law, that was more Bible than I ever seen in my life. Just because you're under the word, just because you have some guy in front of you yelling at you for 40 minutes about some cool stuff, doesn't mean you're an actual Christian. It doesn't mean you're actually doing what the Word says. He expects you to know it. He expects you to have faith enough to have your deep convictions in the Word of God. When people are not moved to truly repent and change for Jesus, then they're not in the Word. They cannot have faith. Back to Isaiah chapter 9, look here in verse 3. You have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest as warriors rejoice in dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, they have shattered the yoke that burdens them. God wants to shatter the yoke that burdens you. And the only way to do that is through His Word. 
It's not even through what I'm doing right now. It's through his word. Isaiah talks about enlarging the nations, increasing their joy. This Midian's defeat that he brings into into mind is Judges 6 through 8. If you're not familiar with that, go read it on your own. It's a wonderful story about Gideon. Gideon had a ton of men. He could have fought this other army and handled them properly. But God says, no, I want you to have only 300 people. And in good form, he obeys God, and God brings about a great victory. So what do we learn from this? What is he trying to say? It doesn't need to be a large group of people. We showed up here. We drove up the Alcan. And we arrived here in July with 14 adults, two teens, one baby who was on the way, now is here, baby Elijah, three dogs, two cats, and an unbeatable faith. That is all that is necessary to take this world by storm. But the odds are stacked against us. The darkness is strong. But the great light that we brought to the state and the city will be victorious. The great light of Christ will dawn. Second point, really quickly, go to John chapter 3, blinded by the light. All right, for those of you that are of the generation, just get the song out of your head. Let's just let it roll. You know what I'm saying? All right. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And here in John chapter 3, we see a little bit more about this. You know, when you see the light, you got two choices. You can either embrace the light, or you can run away from it. John 3, verse 19, Jesus says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but those who love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have, been, what they have done has been done in the sight of God. How do you respond to light? Have you been running from God? Or are you embracing God's call for your life? I guarantee you this, the light will always get your attention. But what you do when that light gets your attention will determine the rest of your life. Go to Acts chapter 9. Let's look at a man who was blinded by the light. Acts chapter 9, look here in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters from the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might ask them to take them as prisoners. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice in him say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? He got that one right. Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go into the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Uh, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man. And all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. The apostle Paul was so zealous for God that he was actually killing Christians. The Bible calls him a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Thoroughly trained, very religious, again, very zealous. He thought that he was doing the right thing for God. He was very sincere in his faith. But sadly, he was sincerely wrong. What is Paul, among many other things, supposed to represent to you and I in this this world? Religious people can be wrong. Just because you can quote scripture, just because you can quote theologians, just because you've got 16 Bibles in your house and you know the the different translation philosophies and all these things, that means jack. Are you putting it into practice in your life? 
Are you actually living by the word or are you living by the world's definition of the word? He was on a road and that road was leading straight to destruction. See, every one of us in this room today and everybody in the whole entire world are on one of two roads this morning. Matthew 7 verse 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. It is a biblical fact that you are on one of two roads today. You are on the narrow path that leads to life, or you're on the wide road that leads to destruction. You know, many of us have heard the words, oh, all roads lead to heaven, all religions lead to heaven. That's not true. Although I... All dogs might go to heaven. I don't know about that. (laughs) But the reality is, all roads lead to God. Now, let me qualify that for a minute. Because some of you might, oh, hey, cool. All right, I'm good. (laughs) No, all roads lead to God because in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every knee will acknowledge, or every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of Father. Every one of us at the gates of heaven will acknowledge who Jesus actually is. But the road that you took to get there will determine whether you get in or you go to the other place. So which road are you on? What will determine what road you're on? Go a little further, Matthew 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock, the rock of Jesus and his words. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, dare I even say refuses to put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Luke's gospel says, and its destruction was complete. You know, I'm super proud of the Phillips. Because the reality is that it's one thing to become a disciple. It's one thing to stay faithful for a season. It's one thing to stay faithful for a time. But it's a whole nother thing to stay faithful for the rest of your life. And the courage that they had to go, you know what? I was blinded by the light. Maybe blinded by a text and the light from the screen illuminated. But God called them, and they answered the call. They wanted to come back into the light, living as a true life of a disciple. But here's the thing. The true life of a disciple is hard. We live in a generation, and I'm not just talking to young people here today. Every single generation has always wanted to take the easy way, period. It's just other generations had it a little harder. They couldn't escape as much as current generations can. G.K. Chesterton wrote in his book, What's Wrong with the World, says, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And so what do we have? We have a bunch of people who claim to be Christians who go to churches, and those churches just feed their itching ears what they want to hear to help them feel better about the religion that they're living in instead of actually looking at the Bible. Being a disciple is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Some of y'all think like your life is hard. No, be a disciple and have your life. That's hard. But he got their attention. And God is trying to get your attention too. God is calling you today. What event in your life has got your attention? Why are you here today? See, one would think that you're here because somebody invited you at a mall or invited you on campus or invited you from your workplace or whatever that may be. That's not why you're here. Because you could have chose to say, that's cool, put it in your pocket, walk away. You could have chose to sleep in, but you chose to get up and come here. Why? That's what my wife so eloquently said. God has set eternity in each and every one of your hearts. And God is going, you need to be here so that you can get right in your relationship with God. Or maybe you can need to restore your relationship with God. Or you need to get on the right track. Maybe you're Paul today. you got theology up the wazoo. You know the Bible. You could parse Greek participles and all that stuff. But God says, hey, you're on the wrong path. That's why I've sent a disciple to you to get you on the right path. 
But you have to accept the calling. You have to accept the truth. See, Paul accepted it. He took him three days to do it. The longest conversion in Scripture took him three days. And so and I said, what are you waiting for, man? Get up. Get baptized. Wash your sins away. Call it on his name. He's like, all right, cool. Let's do it. And he became one of the most powerful preachers in all of Scripture. Point number three, we'll wrap up here. Go to John, or Matthew chapter 5, excuse me. Matthew chapter 5. John chapter 1 verse 9 says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And that is an awesome truth. Point number three is, You are the light of the world. Now, we can read that one of two ways. You could be the light of the world, the sinful world, and you could be the best and draw people to that sinful nature, draw people into the world, or you could be the light to this world. The light of the world reflecting Christ in your life, having a purpose, having a true mission in your life, something that wakes you up in the morning, something that gets you going, a true powerful relationship with God. That could be you. We become the light of the world when we accept our purpose and become true disciples of Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, I don't want to lift up the church. I want to lift the Thrive Campus ministry up. We have not been shy in sharing our faith. We have not been shy in getting into people's lives and saying, hey, you got to change. you got to repent. you got to go after Jesus. And we've met quite a bit of opposition. Quite a bit of opposition. You know what's crazy is where most of our opposition has come from? Not the world. The religious world. The religious world. And... I'm not surprised by that because that's what happened to Jesus. Not surprised by that. But the reality is, is we are called to be the light of the world. He says, not only does God call us to not hide our light, but he says, put it on a stand. Shine it before everybody so that they can see the light of Christ in you. See, we don't go out and share our faith so that we can be somebody. We don't go out and talk to people about Jesus so that we can somehow get the glory. No, no, no. We're reflecting the glory of God into this dark and dying world so that they can see the true light of Christ. Jesus was not afraid to shine his light. And you and I have to be like Jesus. Maybe the most controversial scripture I'm ever going to share with you tonight, today is 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Write that down. Whoever claims, just in your head answer this question. Are you a claimer today? Whoever claims to live in him must walk like Jesus did. Must live like Jesus did. If you're not living like Jesus, then you're not a Christian. You're not a believer. You're not a follower. You're not a disciple. You cannot claim it. It, This is a must, he says. Again, not perfection, but direction. You know, uh, on uh, a rush week, not rush week, but the kickoff week, we were walking, uh, myself and a couple of the guys were walking just uh, uh, a couple sky bridges over here, and I saw this kid uh, studying. And, uh, you know, the guy's got the headphones on, you know what I'm saying? And every time I see a guy with, just to be honest, like every time I see a guy with headphones, I'm like, man, I don't want to bother him. But God said, no, you talk to that guy. So I stopped by. And, uh, and I said, hey, man, uh, you know, we're, part of a, we're starting a campus ministry here. And gave him a card. And, hey, would, would you be interested in getting to Bible study sometimes? like, yeah. I was like, what are you doing right now? Nothing. I was like, you want to do a Bible study right now? He said, yeah. So we sat down with Kenny. And we got into the scriptures. Kenny actually had a Bible in his backpack. And earlier that day, probably about an hour or two before I came up to him, he was reading his Bible. And he's not from Ethiopia. He's from uh, the Congo. Amen. But he's the Ethiopian eunuch in the scriptures. Amen. Who was right there reading the Bible. 
God saw that he was a true worshiper and wanted to come into the light. And it's awesome that he's going to get baptized here today. Does this describe your life? Not that you're on campus all day and inviting all these young kids to, but is your life ca- characterized? Can somebody look at you and go, you know what? I see Jesus in you. Don't answer that from your perspective. Don't answer that from your own emotions. Answer that with the scriptures. You know, Shakespeare said, what's in a name? Churches have many, many names. There's the first church of the last chance world on fire revival and military academy in Dade City, Florida. These are the churches that want to hold a sign and yell at you and tell you you're going to hell unless you repent. Very, very effective. How many of us have experienced those? you got the Halfway Baptist Church in South Carolina. These are the churches that say that you can be half-hearted and committed but still be a Christian. You've got the Faith-Free Lutheran Church in South Carolina. Faith-free. No need to have real faith here. Just show up, feel good about yourself for going to church. You have the Little Hope Baptist Church, but then next to it is the No Hope United Methodist Church. These churches are somewhat self-explanatory. No hope, no life, no real change. Then you have the boring Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now let me pause here for a minute, because some of you might be thinking, wow, is he making these names up and like making fun of all these other denominations? No, these are real names, guys. I literally Googled it, and, and, I, and, I, and I found their websites. These are real names. Like, fact is more funny than fiction. And this one is psycho. This one's crazy. Listen to this. Boring Seventh-day Adventist church. This church goes the extra mile because the name of their pastor is Elder Dull. But in this church, they lack passion and enthusiasm for the Word of God. Everything is about duty and obligation. There's Country Club Christian Church in Kansas City. This may be the fastest growing model of church in America. Then you have the First United Separated Baptist Church in Indiana. This church is one marked by division, gossip, slander. They don't fight for the family of believers. They fight with them. I could go on. There was a list of 60 names that were just weird, crazy. And again, we we can laugh at these names, but the reality is this is the religious world around us. Sadly. Not just the names. The names are no no issue. That's that's a funny illustration. But the reality is that these are the kind of churches that many of us maybe grew up in. Why? Because they did not keep the Word of God. We are called to be people And we are called to be a church that walks like Jesus did. We are called to be a church that is a light to our city, that is a light to this world, and believes in evangelizing not just Anchorage, not just the state of Alaska, but the entire world. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 says, Those who are wise will shine like the darkness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars forever and ever. In this church, we strive to be just that. Not perfect, but letting our light shine that we reach those into darkness and bring people to the light. Let's wrap up here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I know the Word of God has stirred your heart today. I know it. Thank you, Maggie. That's awesome. But I know it has. Because if it hasn't, it still has stirred your heart because you're hardening your heart to the Word of God. And that should flat freak you out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look here in verse 6. I pray that you do not run from the light today, but that you embrace it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, meaning we're, we're so fragile human beings. But this treasure, this light lives inside of us if we're true disciples today to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Christ's sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. You know, you may feel weak this morning. 
You may feel so weak that you cannot let your light shine, that maybe there's a flicker of hope inside of you that's like, yeah, I, I like this, Eric, I see it, I, I want it, but I just don't, I just don't know. But through Christ, you can shine. You may feel hard-pressed, but you can still shine. You may feel crushed, but you can still shine. You may feel perplexed, but you can still shine. You may feel struck down, but you can still shine. Why? Because God gives you the strength to shine through the life of Christ. In fact, the weaker you are, he says, the better. Because you don't get the glory, God gets the glory. You know, what I love about the Bible is that it does not shy away from the real lives of men and women like you and me that God turned their darkness into light. How? Because they chose to not run from God. They chose to not run from the light. As religious or as pagan as they were, it didn't matter. They humbled themselves to the word of God and looked at it as if it was a mirror. Does the word really reflect my life? If it doesn't, you need to fix it. Otherwise, you can't call yourself a Christian. And they chose to embrace the light. They had chose to become men and women of God. With God, they were able to not just change the course of their lives, but the course of history. If God can use them, then he can use you. If God can use them, he can use you and me. Quit chasing the world. Quit being the light of the world. Start being the light of the world through Christ. Answer God's mighty call for your life and let the light of this lost world shine through you and be part of the dawning of a great light here in Anchorage. I love you all very, very much.